Hello, everybody. My name is Carol Lyles Shaw, and I want to welcome you to another of my series of interviews with my friends and colleagues in the quilting and fabric industry. Uh, today, I am so honored to have Lisa Shepard Stewart with me. Uh, we've known each other virtually for a long time. We've met in person in recent years. <laughs> Uh, but she's just a fabulous person and you're going to learn all about her today. Uh, Lisa is a writer and designer and she is based in New Jersey. Her obsession with African textiles began in 1986 during a trip to Senegal, West Africa. Through her publications and her specialty company, which is called Cultured Expressions, Lisa encourages others to express themselves creatively using culturally relevant techniques and materials. She travels to Ghana annually to source artists, fabrics, and materials, which she then provides to you through her store. She also curates and hosts Sojourns, uh, which is spelled S-E-W-J-O-U-R-N-S, which are trips that are just fabulous. They are unique fabric and fiber art experiences to fun destinations around the country and I guess beyond. <laughs> she opened Cultural Expression's first studio location in downtown Rahway, New Jersey in December 2017. In addition to sewing, writing, and fabric collecting, she is a part-time vegetarian who also enjoys travel, entertaining, holistic health, and yoga. So with that, welcome, Lisa. So glad to have you here. Thank you, Carol. Great to be with you again. Yes, <laughs> especially since I'm filming this during COVID and there's so little travel and uh, whatever. Ah! So I want to start, <laughs> <no. laughs> to start by asking you, how did you get into the fabric world, the fabric business? I want to know. <laughs> I think I was, it was just something that was just in me. Um, from the very, very small age, my favorite blanket, I was, I like to tell the story that I had this favorite, like loosely woven blanket and I was just captivated by how the threads would just kind of come together and form fabric and stay together. And I just was, fabric was just my thing ever since then. I still age of like four or five. So from there, uh, at age 12, I learned how to sew. And just, again, fabric just became my thing. You know, it was just, I had all types of fabrics at that point. I mean, not even just African, but just all kinds of fabrics. I was sewing. I burnt out the motor on my first sewing machine because who knew about maintenance? <laughs> um, I mean, like smoke coming out of it. Didn't, I didn't know you had to, at that time, you had to like oil your machines and get them served. I, I didn't know. My, my grandmother had won it in a contest and she gave it to me hoping I would pick up on it. So I did, went to classes at Singer and all that. And I'm burning out the machine, sewing for myself, my mother and all these things. Burnt it, like literally burnt the motor out. So that taught me a very important lesson that I'm glad I learned before I got my first car. I learned about maintenance <laughs> on the sewing machine. <laughs> so luckily I didn't burn a car motor out. I kind of learned by then, by the time I was 17 or whatever. Um, but I always just kept up with the sewing and just loved it. So that led me to FIT, Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City. And instead of studying fashion, because I thought that fashion designers were a dime a dozen, and I just really didn't feel like that was meaty enough, I decided to instead um, study business and marketing. And then the fabrics was always a self-taught end of, of my educational you know, background. So between the two, I felt like I could always find a place or carve a place out for myself or however, um, where I could still love and enjoy fabrics, but have something a little bit more stable than what I thought fashion design, you know, whether it wasn't my thing. So that was the beginning. <laughs> right. <laughs> so tell me about the 1986 trip to Senegal. What happened? That was a trip um, that I took. It was a, a cultural trip, this company in, in Chicago. And they said, it was a, like a general cultural trip, like all kinds of things were going on. But they said, if you had a special interest, We'll try to connect you with people on that end so to make it more meaningful for you and more targeted and all that. And I said, you know, put me up, sign me up for anything fabric related. So they actually got me an appointment 
with the marketing director of one of the biggest fabric mills at the time. At the time, there were a lot more fabric mills in West Africa than there are now. That's a whole nother podcast. But, yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. I was able to meet with him and I mean, he took me to this room, like the showroom, and it was just fabric and batik everywhere, just beautifully displayed. And I was, that's really when the African fabric part of my journey, you know, kicked off because I just, I just couldn't even, I mean, I brought home duffel bags with fabric, no plan for them, but you know how we do. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> yes. so, so I just loved it. And the guy was really nice. He wanted me to stay longer because he happened to be cute and own a, a white Peugeot and took me out to dinner. It was like a whole thing, you know, it was great. <laughs> but I came back home, <laughs> back home with the group on schedule. My aunt had also come on the trip. So she was kind of, thought she was chaperoning or something, but anyway. But it was just a really fun trip and it really opened me up to what's possible as far as the African fabrics. I mean, when I stepped off the plane, a lot of people have this experience, like their first time to Africa, you step off the plane, you just want to kiss the ground. I mean, like you'd have this feeling just come over you like you're home. It's, it's a very interesting feeling. And when you see the women walk by and they're beautifully draped and head wraps and the men look very regal and it just really took me to another level with the whole love of fabric and the, you know, the African culture all combined. So that, that's really where the African texture, textile part started for me. Because it is yeah. a, a beautiful feeling uh somehow traveling abroad because i had a similar experience traveling abroad and having men look at you as an african queen i mean really valuing your beauty and it's it's a it does change you a little bit you know as, really a, as a black woman to have that experience that validating experience that there's a real celebrate. transformation to be surrounded by your own and just I mean, it's, it's just a whole nother feeling. So I recommend if you haven't been to Africa, really try to get there because it, it's, it, it is life changing. And also creatively, it's a whole nother thing, you know. Yes. Um, Good stuff. I've been following African uh, visual artists on different museum and gallery YouTube channels over the past few months. And uh, it, it is quite fascinating um, and, and very stimulating to see their work through different eyes. So um, I first found out about you through your books. So tell us a bit about your publishing history and and what's available now. Okay, the first book that really launched the cultural expressions, you know, part of of my work um, was African Accents, Fabrics and Crafts to Decorate Your Home. Came out in 1999, which means it's now over 20 years old, which I still can't figure the math on that. Um, but it did come out in 99 and it, it, it was a combination of um, decorating my own first place, you know, well, decorating, yeah, the process of decorating it and making it my own when I moved out, my parents, you know, and I had things like mud cloth pillows and people would come over and say, oh, where'd you get that pillow? And so what's that fabric? And it was a real curiosity in the things that I was, you know, beginning to collect and just start to decorate with. And I thought to myself, there's a book somewhere here. And I was looking at, um, like all the Martha Stewart, you know, obviously she was prominent then and, you know, people of that type of, you know, with the decorating and the whole lifestyle thing. And, but her, that whole look at the time was take a floral and a check and a stripe and a dot and like, boom, here's your bedroom. Yeah. Very formulaic. I thought it was just kind of, you know, kind of pretty, but not my, my, didn't give me any sense of anything. Mm -hmm. So I decided that there was probably a book idea in the decorating I was doing. Um, And it was, it wasn't so much that the projects were so astounding. It was more just, here's how to make a pillow and why not make it in mud cloth? And when people saw that, I think the exposure to that idea is kind of what made the book, you know, people well, were drawn to it, just the different use of fabrics. Um, but still it was beginner friendly because again, the, the projects themselves were pretty easy. So I thought that was a nice combination to get the culture involved and also have a nice look and it's practical. So all of that came together into, into African accents. That was the first one. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. No, go on, because there are more yeah, behind yeah. that. <laughs> the second book was also based on my own interest in decorating, where at this point, like I started to incorporate things from other cultures, not just African fabric, but I had like an Indonesian totem pole in my dining room and, um, you know, sari fabrics and things from India, that kind of thing. So I decided, hey, here's another book idea. Um, and that became Global Expressions, the second book, right. and it came out two years later. Mm-hmm. And in that too, I kind of talked about the cultures behind the fabrics, how they use the fabric traditionally, how you can either make a lookalike or how you can find them, that whole thing. Um, 
So again, it was culturally based and the practicality of decorating and bringing that into your own space and the feeling that you get from that. So that was the whole, you know, again, the decorating um, idea on that one. Mm -hmm. And then the third one, I self-published in 2007, again, looking at trends and how can I fit them into to my, you know, my space and my interests. 2007 was one of those banner years for handbag making. Like everybody and their mother who sewed made handbags. Bags were like the thing. Mm -hmm. I thought to myself again, I can't be the only one who would love this. How about a, a book of handbags in African fabric? Yes. You know, and, and it, again, it just, it just kind of worked. And then by 2007, publishing had changed where I felt like I could self-publish it. You know, mm -hmm. you, you do all the publishing yourself and the layout and all that, send it to a printer and your book comes back and guess what? You have all the, all the profits. You don't have to wait for a royalty check and that kind of thing. Right. <laughs> um, so, you know, the industry changed, technology had changed. We talked about technology before, but, and I said that I, I, I embrace technology to the point that I need it. You know, like, so if I need something, I'll, I'll kind of, as opposed to you who like love everything. <laughs> but um, so I embrace enough technology to get the book, you know, kind of self-published. And mm -hmm. again, that was 2007. So in between the, I guess, second and third book, I was, um, you know, began going to the guilds and getting classes together, selling online. Um, I remember the first guild I spoke with or spoke to after African Accents, the first book came out, I went and did a trunk show. Mm -hmm. And I'm showing them things from the book and things I'd made since the book and talking about book, book, book. And they said, well, didn't you bring any fabric to sell? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I'm like new to the whole speaking. This is my first, like one of the like first, you know, guild yes. things. I think it was Pennsylvania. And they, yeah, they, they were very sweet. But then they got a little like hostile because I didn't bring any fabric. <laughs> like, oh my, okay. Mm -hmm. I, and I thought that was like too, for some reason I didn't put the two together that it's supposed to be a commercial like endeavor where you're supposed to bring stuff to sell. Yeah. So I was like, wow. So that got me on, I need some, you know, some merchandise. I started getting prints and some boutiques, things like from Ghana. Because my first Ghana trip was 2001. So by then I was beginning to make connections and I could get things over. Right. So I never made that mistake again. I always had books and I always had <laughs> merchandise to sell and it's been, it's been gravy since then. But yeah. that really taught me something like, oh, now I need to, especially these fabrics that are more unique than a calico. You know, you can't just mm -hmm. go to the quilt shop and pick these up. So that really, I saw the opportunity, like, well, I really need to start selling this stuff and really promoting it and making a package with the book and with, the, you know, classes and all that. So that's kind of how it came about, with listening to people and reacting and, and growing from there. Um, I, I, I can really relate to, oh, I should bring <laughs> stuff to sell because I think my first couple oh, light trips bulb. to Gale, oh, yeah. I took five books, you know, or right, something. Exactly, people were like, exactly. That's all you brought. <laughs> I know. I think that's like the modesty in us, or something. It's yes. like, oh, well, you know, here's my book, and if you want to buy, you know, but yeah, you just you had to get out there, and it's more with social media. Obviously, that you know, you, you're used to it now. But back then, there was no social media, and you just mm -hmm. had your little web page, and so I learned a lot from that. But that's what you're supposed to do is learn and grow. So it was, yes. it was. I laugh at it now, but it was just like bring fabric I'm like oh no like like can I come back with it I was like oh no you know so it was interesting <laughs> oh that's so funny but but it was it was so real we all I mean we meaning all quilt teachers mm -hmm. uh, folks on that circuit um, you, you we learn. have to learn and <laughs> learn with each other <laughs> very much so and learn quick too <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Speaking yes. of that, I mean, 2020. Uh, <laughs> yeah, how, pivots, right? How are you managing your business in 2020? You know, business has been good, actually. I know all throughout the sewing category, I mean, sewing is, is up. And they always say, like, in an economic, economic downturn, sewing and like what I call the home arts, you know, um, gardening and cooking, they all seem to flourish because people are home. Right. Well, 2020 took that to a whole nother level about being home and, you know, the home mm -hmm. arts or whatever you want to call them. So the sewing has been great. Um, it started with the mask making. So yes. people want, you know, needed fabric for masks. First, they wanted to buy masks from me. And I started to make a few. I got through a, for sale. You know, I got through about 50 and I was like, I'm not doing this. So I came out with a mask making kit for those who sew. And I just packaged it up to make three masks. And you know, we that's still available. We kind of did that. But talk about pivoting, we just had to kind of think and what, what, what can we do? 
I thought that like everybody else, I would have time to be at home and enjoy some time to work on other projects, like, you know, personal projects. But I was so busy at the studio, I was spending, you know, till midnight here, just shipping orders. Mm -hmm. um, we couldn't be open to the public, but I could, as long as I didn't let anybody in, I could be here and, you know, ship my orders. Post office was still functioning. Everything was fine. So I could still mm -hmm. at least, you know, help people through, through the, the website. Um, and then I was doing virtual visits, which I had done before the pandemic, but they obviously kicked up where people can shop by Zoom meeting or shop by um, Google Duo or WhatsApp. We use those three, you know, choices. Right. And what I changed in the pandemic is I went to, um, online booking for the virtual so you can go on a website book your time and then we meet and you know we kind of do that because there were more that were happening so i decided to automate that a little bit mm -hmm. and it's just been a lot of pivoting i mean i just have not really really haven't stopped and then the other pivot is going to online classes which were always in my mind before the pandemic mm -hmm. like oh i gotta get started with it and people would ask you know people outside of broadway new jersey you know would say well, you know can we do a class but the pandemic, boom, you've got to do online. So now I, we just published the second one yesterday, um, the string quilt class. And the first one was a little pouch class. And so we're, I'm constantly in a state of, you know, how can we serve more people? How can we get, you know, people what they need? And it's, mm -hmm. it's been really interesting. And then there was the, also another, there a lot of things going on with this pandemic. Um, the supply chain, you know, was a little crazy. It's stabilized some. Um, I see mm -hmm. you shaking your head. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, elastic was like toilet paper for a hot minute. You know, if you were making masks, you could not find elastic online or anywhere. And the qualities fluctuated. It was crazy. It's, it's stabilized a little now. But um, even getting my fabrics in, you know, everybody wanted prints. There were times when I got low on my supply, waiting for my suppliers to hopefully get their things. And it was a real challenge throughout all of spring. But like I said, things are, have gotten a little bit better and it's still busy. So it's, it's just been really nonstop. I mean, thankfully, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. I see it as an opportunity. So I just keep plugging. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I remember we have been talking, you know, obviously off and on uh, when everything shut down and uh, I was fortunate right. because I had already been planning an on-demand class. Uh, I had been planning it for a year and a half, but finally, you know, mm -hmm. got myself together and finally got it out there in early 2020. Uh, but I had to even, even with that on-demand class uh, and learning about uh, doing all the filming and all and editing and so forth, mm -hmm. I still had to pivot my head around uh, doing live classes through Zoom. And I have to say, okay. I love teaching live through Zoom. And I'm hearing from students now saying that after they have a good experience with you or me or whoever, with a live Zoom class, mm -hmm. they are thinking they don't want to go away from that. They really like being in it's their very, own studio right right and there's a lot, I think there's a lot of reasons for that too one is you have access to all your stuff you don't have to pack up half your house to go to a class mm -hmm. you know you're comfortable you're in your slippers there's a there are a lot of benefits to it and i think we're all starting to see like wow this really works you know so um <laughs> it's very very interesting it's very but now one of the bigger disappointments i had with the pandemic was having to cancel our event that was planned for may Right. That was right. probably that was probably the. I mean, and obviously everybody has, uh, you know, stories about things they had to cancel. But that was yeah. one of my biggest, like, oh, because it was going to be so awesome, and it still will be one day. So I just want to circle back to your classes. So, are you offering live and on-demand classes? Tell us a bit about that. What you're offering as of today? Well, I'm starting with the on-demand more. Um, the live classes, I structure those more around a guild, so I have already a set number of people, and I don't really. It's, it makes the marketing easier to have a group yeah. come to me and say we want to do a live class. So that's what I'm focusing on for the live and also live um, trunk shows, mm -hmm. which go really well. I had a, one group um, in California. They're, again, like everybody else, just transitioning to, you know, meeting at home from home and all that. And I was their first speaker as a, as a Zoom speaker. And they were just really excited that it worked out so well. So that was, it was a lot of firsts are going on. Yeah. Um, 
So as far as live, I like to have a group come to me and, and rather than put it on live and wait for people to sign up, I haven't done that yet. Mm -hmm. Not to say that I won't, but I'm just kind of easing my way into the, you know, like everybody else. So yeah, um, it's really more of a guild thing right now as far as the live mm -hmm. events. Uh, shift, because I know, first of all, question people I'm sure are thinking, what is she wearing? What is that gorgeous jacket? So tell <laughs> us about your jacket. <laughs> this is one of my classes. It's a Bogolan shrug. Let me see if I can show you the whole thing. So it's a little like bolero. Yes. Oh, and, cool. You know, a little shrug. It's chilly in here. They haven't turned my heat on yet. I think October 15th, <laughs> turn the heat on. <laughs> right. <laughs> that, uh, that retail life, you know. But it was a little chilly. I said, oh, let me just put this on today. So yes, yeah, a simple little class. Um, the pro this could probably be a pretty simple virtual class. So mm -hmm. I'm sure that. But um, I'm just what's, kind of... What's the fabric? People. What fabric is it? It's mud cloth. It's Bogolan. So it's hand woven. It's from Mali. I left the raw edges and just turned the cuff up. Cool. And it's, sewn, it's made in strips. The strips are sewn together. See, that there's this one seam from the strip. Right. And they're about five inches wide. Mm -hmm. And they just, just a fun fabric. Yeah. So how are the so markings cool. achieved on uh, mud cloth? Is it paint or what is it? It's, um, well, actually mud cloth, the, the real name is Bogolan. And um, mud cloth is a nickname that came when traders came and saw how it was made because it was, they used like a river clay that has different like kind of chemical reactions. So what they'll do is, mark the designs in like a, a caustic or a bleach solution mm -hmm. then they dye the fabric in the mud which is basically like cooked down roots and leaves and twigs mm -hmm. you know they make the, the dye they dip it in the mud and then whatever had the caustic bleach solutions that's where you get your designs and then part right. of it is also hand painted it's, it's a big combination of stuff and then mm -hmm. they they rinse it and dry it in the sun and rinse it and dry it in the sun yeah it's a big process but we yeah. love it you know, I use it for pillows and handbags and all kinds of stuff. So. Great. Well, with that, I think we should do a virtual tour of your studio. <laughs> Hi, everybody. We're now doing a virtual studio tour. Lisa, take it away. So this is my studio where I spend more time than I spend at home. <laughs> um, we've got African prints, uh, pieces that are more inspiration pieces up on the wall. and People like to try and come in and, and buy some of the pieces. I'm like, well, no, you have to make your own, but I can show you how. It's one of those kind of places. <laughs> Got some dashiki prints, more inspiration up here. Uh, before you go forward, tell us mm -hmm. about that piece on the wall, that sort of black and white piece. Tell us a little bit about that piece. I made this piece about, I'm going to guess 15 years, so it's probably more like 18, because you know how the time goes. But um, it's just a combination of mud cloth and the, the figures, the animal figures and the hunter figures are a fabric called Cordgo, which is from the Ivory Coast. It's made in a similar way as the mud cloth, like similar dye, but these are more figures as opposed to just geometrics. So I had a bunch of um, just different, you know, pieces from different, different projects and things. I decided to piece this together. And I don't really do a lot of quilting quilting. I like to do the piecing. So you see, I just put some cowrie shells to anchor it. I really do need to take it down and quilt it one day, but that's going to be one of those retirement projects, probably. <laughs> and then um, the border fabric, see on the edge of that beige border, if I had a thousand yards of that, it would all be gone, like sold. And I can't, I, I think I bought like 12 yards when I first saw it. And again, it's probably like 20 years ago. And I love it. There are just animals on it and just all kinds of cool things. And it just worked with the fabric. But uh, people come in, even even now, they're like, do you have that board? I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and one lady and her friends came in, it was funny. She's like, how come everything, you know, you don't have anything that's made up? I said, well, I made these, these um, you know, projects like easily over, you know, 15 years ago. And she's like, I said, I can't make new things for every time I have new fabric. It wouldn't work. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you, you got some an army of assistants. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a bit much, you know. So um, we got some supplies here. And then we've got some panels. Now the panels are also a class. We have this is where we have the classes and things. I actually had a a um a waste bead party the other night, six people. So anyway, this is one of the classes where you take a panel and we do like creative borders on it. So some of these are just class samples. And we've got the batik Ghana, 
And these are jacquard de pique, which means they have like a woven design in the background. So it's like a damask or jacquard bead, but then they do wax ah, beads over mm-hmm. That's really cool. So we sell these by the yard. I can't go to Ghana this year. And again, you know, you take it in stride, but I'm hoping that maybe spring, we'll see how it goes. More petite here. This is just like a little artsy piece, just raw edge applique. Cool. Yeah, little, just sew it down the middle of the strip. I just made a little piece, you know, just combining colors, things like that. Right. And then you mentioned my big scissors. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that the mayors use for a grand opening. Oh, and yes. So, right. So the mayor has to his own because he does all these openings all the time around town. But I, I knew I would want to keep mine, so I bought mine. And when he came, I said, no, here, use mine. Everybody laughed. Because, like, why would she have, you know? I mean, only a sewing studio would have these things. <laughs> right. so, he had the same exact ones, literally, off of Amazon. Like, he had the <laughs> same thing. So. But they laughed that I had my own. I was like, no, I want to keep mine. So, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> then we have the table that mostly the, the quilters kind of gravitate to with the the uh, back quarters all set up and 10 inch squares, five inch squares, jelly rolls, all kinds of fun stuff like that. So we just kind of keep things colorful. It's just, it's just fun to be here all day. And I, I think I do absorb the energy of the fabrics because it just, you know, it just kind of makes me happy. These are the two books, Global Expression and On the Go. There they are. So people, get your orders in. <laughs> and they're, they're online for fifteen ninety five, as opposed to the, the, uh, the cover price, I think, is 22 for that. And then we've got more Bogolan, also known as Mud Cloth. I just redecorated this corner of the, of the, of the place just to kind of give it a little more. Right. More. Here's another black and green piece. And then over here, we have the husband waiting area. <laughs> <laughs> and they actually come in and just sit like they know their role it's so funny <laughs> it's like, that they, is funny <laughs> you that maybe i don't know but they just kind of resign themselves to sit no no big screen tv but you know so that's pretty much the space you know in the back i'm still redecorating so i'm not going to show you that tomorrow. okay so, <laughs> we have a good time here yep well, I have a couple more questions, so let's pause and uh, get you back on screen. So thanks, Lisa, for the tour, the walk around. And uh, I guess that's an example of if someone wants to shop virtually with you. Uh, exactly. exactly. That's how you would handle it. That's great. Right. Well, they can say, give me this or however, you know. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. And you yep. can pull out what you've got and, right. you know, if they want to assemble their own you know, set of fabrics. Oh yeah, they're, they're a lot of fun. They're a lot of fun. They're even more fun when two or three friends get together and they all zoom in on the, on the same shopping trip. <laughs> oh, that's fun. <laughs> yeah. They enable each other, you know, the whole thing. <laughs> right, no, get that, Carol, get that. <laughs> right, right, I want some too, then they start fighting over it. it, it it's fun though. <laughs> it, it's all good then, you know, so. Well, you showed us a number of fabrics like the Jacquard uh, Batiks, were they? Which have right. more of a texture. And then you showed us the fat quarter and, and yardage table. Which fabrics uh, would typically be used by a quilt maker who's making a baby quilt or a gift quilt that's actually going to be used and washed in the washing machine and that sort of thing? What, what right. fabrics do you tend to um, suggest? I would suggest the prints. Um, just because they're, they're commercial prints, they're made in a mill like any other, you know, prints that we would use. So uh, they would, as far as holding up, they would hold up probably the most, you know, the most uh, easily. Um, I think quilters are more, they're, they're more comparable to what quilters use too. So, you know, they're more familiar with it. It's just a plain weave fabric with a pretty print on it. Um, so they're probably the easiest, even though a lot of people do use the, the jacquard batiks for quilts and for, we use them for handbags. We have a great handbag class that mm -hmm. we use squares right. and do, a, a, you know, and then I use mud cloth, like I said. I use Kuba, I use all kinds of different weights together. I use a lot of upholstery fabrics, but for basics, I would say stick with the prints. And then we have the prints also in a lot of um, pre-cuts, like I was showing on the table. Right. So mm -hmm. it's easy to, to kind of pick out a few and just kind of play with, play, play around with them. Right, uh, and uh, I tend to use 
the, the specialty, more specialty fabrics like the, the Bogolan and uh, the jacquard and so forth in art quilts or wall, or wall hangings. Exactly. Although, you know, as a modern quilter, you could definitely take some of my patterns, like the one behind me, which is going to be yeah. my new on-demand class. But Beautiful. you could absolutely use uh, jacquards and African prints uh, and make it a wall hanging as opposed to yeah. something yes. you're going to you know, let a baby roll around on or something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I may need to do that, <laughs> make a version. And then the batik colors are vivid like yours, so you start mixing, yeah. and I know, you, I know you like the grunge, so that would be a great mix, you know, a great combination right. too. So, yeah, yeah um, I find that um, grunge and the uh, modeled, very subtle modeled prints go great with African print. 100% cottons. They just, they're, they really showcase them. They're perfect. It's just enough weight and yeah, they, mm -hmm. they look really well together. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm ready to do some shopping. <laughs> My last question is, is one that I, I'm sure you get. I know I get it uh, when I talk about using African inspired textiles. Uh, and that is from people, quilters, uh, sewists who are not of African descent mm -hmm. and sometimes they are they are cautious or hesitant and wonder is it okay for them to use those kinds of fabrics the ones you sell in your shop how do you respond when people ask you that question um well I've been getting that question because even before I had the studio I opened it in 17 you know I would do shows and I would get that question people coming to the booth and I think that the fabrics are open for anyone to use. Um, I think it's like anything else that has meaning, certain, there are certain meanings or symbols or background that you should at least be familiar with. I think that using anything without kind of knowing where, where it came from or, you know, is maybe not the best way to do it. Um, right. But people often do come to my booth and they'll ask me questions, well, how is this made? Or, and that shows me that they have some level of respect for it. And right. you know, I think that's great. Uh, the cultural exchange is, is fine. I don't see that as appropriation so much. Mm -hmm. Appropriation is a word that's thrown around a lot. Um, but I think they're to be enjoyed, just like you may have a Komodo fabric and you want you know, to use right. it in a certain way. So it's a matter of respecting the culture. Um, if there are symbols on it, this doesn't have any, but if there are symbols or um, you know, colors are significant, that's why in the books, I give you some background on the fabrics that you kind of know what you're using and it kind of just helps the whole conversation. Also, when you're showing it off, whatever you've made, you can sound knowledgeable and you can share the experience of what the fabric is. And I think that adds to the whole you know, experience for everybody. So right. ask questions and I think everybody's welcome to use it, yeah. I, I love that answer. <laughs> and uh, it's, it, it's just, such a thoughtful answer uh, and it respects the question because I think the question usually comes from a place of respect uh, right. And, right. and to honor it that to way. Ask, and you deserve you deserve a thoughtful answer so I mean it's yeah. you know there's that respect now if someone just comes in and wants to just maybe act like something they're not or something that's another mm -hmm. yeah. way to do it but if you're just coming in and you want to appreciate it I mean I have customers of all backgrounds and I've always have and even with the book I knew that it wouldn't be just black, you know, creative people buying the book. Otherwise, it wouldn't have gone through the marketing, you know, of, of the, the marketing process of the publisher. Right. You know, they thought that too. So I, I let them know that there are people that appreciate world fabrics and African fabrics and it would be fine. So yeah. it's, you know, it, it's, I think it's to be enjoyed by everybody and understood by everybody. So uh, I want to end this on... A positive note, what are you looking forward to in the next few weeks, months that you're working on or thinking about? Wow. The next few weeks and months, I have a really exciting um, kids kit coming out. So I'm taking a break from doing any more new classes. I have the two online classes. I wanted to get at least two up. I'm developing a kids kit that I've had in my head for way too long. And again, COVID makes you kind of, you know, <laughs> pull out ideas and things like that. Um, with all the homeschooling and with all the emphasis on African and black culture right now, I felt like the time really is right now. So they're going to have fabrics and beads, some educational material, um, project ideas, like a little activity kit. Mm -hmm. And I haven't seen anything like that with African, with an African, you know, focus. I've seen activity kits with like the pipe cleaners and, you know, things like that. But this is going to be a really kind of special thing. So I'm working on that. 
I'm going to woodshed, as they call it, for like the next two weeks and really try to get that done and, and promoted. Um, in my newsletter, I was asking for, for young models to kind of come in and take pictures of them, you know, doing the craft. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm getting to that point where I really want to just kind of launch it and get that going. So that's going to be fun. And more put me classes. Down for three kits, because I put me down for the first three. <laughs> I have first three kit. kids who need those kits. It's going to be really cute. Yeah, I'm, I'm working on the packaging, and they're going to get cording. And it's like going to be a whole, like, here's a box of things to do that's not, you know, being on your phone, that kind of thing. It's tactile. Right and educational but not overload just you know some light yeah. facts and then hopefully they, they're interested after that but i'm really yeah. excited about that well thank you lisa this has been a great conversation thank you, thank you. <laughs> it almost I, feels I, like i'm there i'm <laughs> so inspired by you and i mean just the push and getting the online classes and you really made me see that it's possible so i want to thank you for that oh really. you're welcome you're welcome and thanks everybody for watching uh be sure to check out the other videos uh i'll be popping them up every couple of weeks um, <laughs> but be sure to tune in <laughs> to, to this great. YouTube channel. And thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>